A serial life sciences entrepreneur and venture capitalist, Jeff Von Maltzen is both a principal at flagship venture labs that funds and launches life sciences startups and also currently CEO of several life science startups. Jeff is also author of numerous patents. How does he do it all? Effortlessly and with elegance. As you will hear on our ENET video, when Jeff talks about building the concerto, with all the different pieces that need to be brought together for a successful life sciences startup company. This video is the third of three from ENET's September 2nd, 2014 meeting that was moderated by Boston business and tax attorney Robert Adelson, who was named among the top 20 Boston startup lawyers by ChubbyBrain.com, a website that provides tools for entrepreneurs, and co-organizer Andy Snyder, a scientist and life sciences executive who recruited Jeff von Maltzen as a speaker for this venue. In this video, Jeff responds to questions posed by Andy in a more interactive session for our third and final ENET speaker of the evening. Okay, now we have our, our third speaker, and that is uh, Jeff uh, von Maltzen. Uh, and now we move to uh, the life sciences, uh, where Jeff is a uh, serial entrepreneur and also a venture capitalist in the life sciences field. He's both a principal at uh, flagship uh, venture labs in Cambridge, uh, which funds and launches life sciences startups. Uh, but he's also currently a CEO of several different life science companies and uh, also the author of uh, numerous patents. And so he's going to talk about building the concerto uh, of all different pieces that you need to have brought together to have a successful life sciences startup. And uh, my meeting uh, co-organizer, uh, Andy Snyder, who recruited uh, Jeff, uh, himself a uh, life sciences executive with a uh, company uh, called uh, Target Ox, uh, also in Cambridge. And uh, so uh, yeah, Andy has some questions for Jeff, so I'll hand it over to Andy. Thanks, Alan. Thank you for your story. Um, I think you founded over six companies in a pretty short span. Um, I guess you can take us through the history. I guess a lot of it started in graduate school, uh, your work with nanoparticles and, and the like. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be invited to, to talk to everybody here today. I, I almost feel like there's whatever SNP is in each of our genomes, um, or you know, it almost feels like a self-help help session for me, kind of getting to hear other people talk enthusiastically about the crazy decisions that led them down, led them also down an entrepreneurial path. And um, so I feel like I should start by saying, yeah, I admit I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, so I, I actually absolutely never had a plan for how I would end up being an entrepreneur. And maybe that was the singular force that drove me to do it. Um, I, I guess to go all the way back, um, uh, my mother's a Montessori, Montessori school teacher and uh, loves sharing with her classes and, and similarly did to us when we were kids sort of stories of the great adventurers and uh, Shackleton voyage down to, down to uh, the, the South Pole and getting trapped in the ice and then do, doing everything possible to sort of release yourself from the grips of freezing winter plus um, absolutely hazardous um, uh, insults at every pass. And um, I actually fell in love with, with art first and um, went to MIT as an undergraduate sort of thinking that a, a place as wacky as MIT and as technological might be a really fun place to think about the visual arts in that context. And um, stumbled on ways of doing that that I hadn't anticipated at all. And, um, particularly had an affinity for what I, I guess I would call the cognitive dissonance between sort of the art side of biology and the engineering side of the world. On, on either side of that equation, both of which are right, and I, I think most of the audience is, is on the engineering side, um, you know, where rightly or wrongly things are viewed in cause and effect, and at some level everything has uh, implications that at a systems level can be understood and defined in different modules and whether it's an electrical engineering context, a chemical engineering one, things are understandable. And on the biological side of things from an artistic perspective there's this sense of sort of constant nuance 
and almost never ending intricacy to the way that things can unfold the more closely you look or the way that things are, are connected. And we only get these, um, anybody who's practiced biological technology or biology research of any time, at kind, you know these pains, painful glimpses of pieces of what biology is and we're trying to assemble sort of this visual puzzle of how it all works together. And, and to me, uh, having a father who's an engineer and having grown up in sort of kind of viewing my trajectory as being one that would be visual or artistic, um, that was this kind of an amazing medium to try to see where, where those ends might, might meet. And uh, particularly that was crystallized in um, me bouncing around, uh, sharing an idea I had with every one of the TAs that I had in my classes, and they all recommended that I should talk to one particular professor. And I went to share the idea with the professor, sort of sweating and running in, and um, enthusiastically stating how you might be able to take protein engineering technologies and maybe make proteins that acted like totally different biomolecules. Specifically, could they act like fats and form micelles and bilayers and potentially have application in all the places that surfactants do industrially, in medicine, and maybe even in taste. And as condescendingly as possible, the professors declared to me why that would never be possible. Uh, for reasons that, um, as I sat there, I, I didn't fully agree with, but the way that I'm wired, the, the condescension was more than enough for me to just arbitrarily heave myself in the direction of trying to make that possible. <laughs> and um, it opened up one of these really rare doors, again, for people who labored in the realm of biological research, um, where it happened that within six months in a different lab, we built 50 new materials around that hypothesis. And every experiment sort of worked on the first, second, or third try, kind of as we did envision. Uh, again, really unusual, and I've since learned how unusual that is. Um, but I was absolutely hooked at sort of this marriage between biology and engineering, and or call it sort of design biology and engineering. And, and ever since I've just been adding things to that, sort of in part driven by realizing progressively the whole spectrum of things that, that have to matter for ideas to, um, or you have to bring to bear for ideas to matter in the real world. So um, during the course of grad school, um, fell in love with sort of the world of the nanotechnology or ways of embedding yet more sort of data or sophistication than you can in one small molecule into scaffolds and then start trying to get nanoparticles to work together and talk to each other in the bloodstream in analogous ways to the way that immune cells talk to each other to try to coordinate uh, the treatment and targeting the sites of disease. And um, serendipitously was able to start a company with um, two entrepreneurs who were absolutely spectacular mentors. Opened up a whole world that you know I realized would um, was potentially sort of this this conduit of fun experiences, but you know which would allow me access to starting to learn about the things that would ultimately um, be um, an important part of being able to invent things that can matter. In the and um, my second experience was probably the most meaningful. So that's, that's the one that absolutely got me hooked. And uh, I think consistent with the theme, um, you're not always hooked in entrepreneurship by successes. In fact, you're usually hooked by failures. Um, in that, uh, like anything that is, that you, you, know, you put your heart and soul into and you fall down, there's so much that you end up learning at so many different levels from that. I spent three years developing technology. And um, you know that three years was sort of days that you know never ended, and um, all of that was for the purpose of, of viewing this technology may have an ability to deliver therapeutics to cancer cells more effectively. And um, we generated some data that showed that, uh, in contrast to the typical approaches that people took to do that, we had a means by which we could, with more than an order of magnitude more efficiency we could deliver therapeutics specifically to sites of cancer formation in mouse models. And we started a company, we brought in a CEO, we had a venture fund that wanted to put a lot of money into it. And then literally for the first time, we started looking at, okay, well, um, you know, which cancer should we focus on? Is it all cancer was, was, was one disease? And um, what would our regulatory path be? And, and what does our intellectual property really look like? And it, it won't surprise anybody in the audience, but it, certainly surprised me at the time. When you haven't paid attention to something, you usually haven't optimized for it. And every one of those, you could point to something that was not ideal to be starting a company around. And, and as one example, 
every regulatory advisor we brought in um, was just absolutely running in the direction, running in the other direction when they had heard about the mechanism of action that the, the system utilized. And I thought, well, that's unfortunate. There was absolutely no necessity to choose that mechanism of action. In fact, without going into the details, it was somewhat arbitrary and driven by convenience at the time. But three years later, I spent three years developing a system around that. And um, yet, it would have been one that there were really no good preclinical tox models for, and it would be very difficult to motivate safety in a phase one uh, clinical trial for actually one of the major um, concerns that people have in the setting of, of treating cancer. So uh, that and the spectrum of everything else led us to end up shutting down the company. And I had a fun situation of going from motivating the company and how it was a transformative new way of delivering therapeutics entirely, genuinely, to one month later, having learned all of this, and went back into the firm to motivate why we should, in fact, be not starting a company out of this. And <laughs> the echoes of the previous meeting were still in the room, and there was sort of like, no, 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 let's, you know, let's do this. This is a whole new way of delivering therapeutics. And I was like, boy, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm walking away not arbitrarily here, but you know, based on things that we've learned. And, and, and so what I pulled from that was a desire to, at the very first step of actually trying to invent a technology, to be already contemplating not just the scientific constraints and, and not just in a medical context, the medical constraints, but to also be weaving in questions about, particularly in highly regulated industries, how, you, how might you be able to take a favorable regulatory path and be able to ask sort of the dis dispositive question that you care about much more efficiently, much more quickly, and much more fast? Or what does the intellectual property situation really look like? In a lot of places today, IP law is kind of like this spring that just jumped into a totally different location in the room. And um, there's opportunities or there's consequences to you know whether or not you understand the details of that. So, um, started realizing that I need to learn a lot more about intellectual property. And um, every single aspect of what a technology needs to go through to go, to go into the market, I realized, boy, I actually need to learn that. And for better or worse, I sort of view the world as hypotheses waiting to be tested and you know, hypotheses either showing truth or not and wanting to whatever the setting is to have unscrubbed data, wanting to see every outlier. And, um, for me, the fun part of entrepreneurship is actually every single one of those domains is completely amenable to hypothesis testing. Oh, I got a hypothesis that you know we might be able to solve this problem by taking this regulatory path if a technology looked like this. And you can test that. And you know what you end up optimizing for is something much more complicated than just a single technology. And, um, you know, as as, as as the other speakers were saying, there's sort of this I think sort of. You have to have this, this affinity for trying to take nothing and make something out of it. And to me, that, you know, that in many ways is the essence of it. It's just that between that nothing and something, there's a whole bunch of different things that, that need to be, be contemplated. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, we, could, we could let Andy ask a couple more sure. questions. Yeah, of course. Okay. Just a few more minutes. So maybe, maybe we get a couple of short answers from a couple more questions. Well, you know, um, really founded a remarkable group of companies where it's, it's a lot of first-in-class molecules for, for life sciences. And I'm just wondering how, how you flush out the ideas, frankly, and, and you know, um, what, what the process of flesh and to use to, to, to get to the point where they're going to pull the trigger and start a company there in, in a first-in-class space. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, and, and let me give some context as to what flagship is. Flagship is a venture capital firm. We have about a billion dollars under management. Um, everybody here knows what venture capital is. Uh, the venture lab side of flagship is the side that I'm on. And so, so I'm never paying due diligence on an investment. I'm never the, I, I don't consider myself a venture capitalist. Most of my colleagues also would not consider me a venture capitalist. Um, but on our lab side of things, we're trying to take a big step back from companies that are coming in the door with a team, a technology, a plan, intellectual property, et cetera, and simply ask more fundamentally, you know, where does the world have huge problems that are unsolved? And where is there potentially new science that changes assumptions in a really fundamental way? 
And um, the sort of those two interfaces of, of sort of where are there market needs that are unsolved or where are there problems that exist in the world. And then mostly for me and for our team operating the life sciences of sort of asking, you know, where's there a realm of, of really assumption shattering um, possibility? And then, you know, operating in a hypothesis driven manner to, to ask the question of, could you contemplate intervening in, and to give a tangible example, um, there, you look at almost every major chronic disease in, in our uh, American society, and they're linked uh, intimately or, uh, or at least closely to the bad diet. And you know, so we started asking the question of, well, if you look at the chemical complexity of a burger relative to one drug, the, pharmaco the pharmacology of that burger is extraordinarily sophisticated. And we call it you know, 500 calories, which would be fine if that just exploded when it went into your stomach. But in fact, you know, it, um, via a whole bunch of biochemical processes, ends up distributing signal signaling molecules and building blocks and a lot of other pharmacology into your bloodstream. We started asking, well, if you could understand that, could you actually create a company that outright treated diseases that are linked to or driven by a bad diet, or was able to understand sort of the nuance of cost and taste and preference and pharmacology and nutrition to be able to help avoid diseases in the first place. And um, so that was based on kind of a hunch that there's got to be something in food, if you look close enough, that is, is sort of definable, that could be therapeutic and perhaps would have a regulatory advantage relative to uh, you know, taking a xenochemical and trying to progress that in petri dishes to mice and to eventually get to humans after you spend $100 million. And so that company, Pronutria, we literally started it by getting kicked out of a grocery store for <laughs> taking photographs of every single food item in there to develop sort of this map of you know, macroscopically what's in foods. You know. So what if it's as simple as carbohydrates, proteins, fats, etc.? What's in you know what, what's the full repertoire? And ended up realizing that there was this huge amount of pharmacology in proteins, and um, that company is based on tapping into ways that our biology evolved to experience nutrients, respond to it, um, trigger important anabolic responses like when you synthesize muscle, to what degree you synthesize muscle to be able to treat diseases of debilitating muscle atrophy, as well as to intervene in some of the most complex and central processes around obesity. So, so that, that's a vignette, and I wish there was a magical answer, but um, um, sort of take that vignette and then imagine a year of thinking nonstop about the various hypotheses of how does regulation plus IP plus dietary pharmacology interact to be able to potentially do something uh, that could be new. Jeff, that's great. Uh, Andy, do you, do you want to ask Jeff one other question, and then we'll move it to the Q&A for the, the, uh, the, the general group here? Yeah, I'll just ask one, one kind of follow-on to the previous question. You know, in, in life sciences, there are a lot of companies rebranding themselves as kind of immuno-oncology, which is a, like a hot field. How do you resist the urge to say, me too, or you know, follow the leader, and really be followed? <laughs> Uh, so that's actually one of the things that I really love about inventing in a venture capital firm is that every single day the best idea coming out of Harvard or MIT or you know a talented group of entrepreneurs is, is down the hall pitching something and I'm not gonna have a job you know sort of sitting in, in, in my position down the hall if I'm coming in and I'm redundant or overlapping because the reality is that for the firm, um, we put a ton more reputation behind something when we started. And for us as individuals, it's 10,000 times harder to create something, maybe add a couple more orders of magnitude to that than to invest in something. And I don't mean to trivialize the investment side of things, but um, holy shit is it hard to create a company from scratch and you, know, you have to find thousands of hours in your life to um, steadfastly put behind creating Know, create building that into something so um, it, it's actually this very I think healthy sort of forcing function where our default is always to invest in things and you know therefore what that leaves are you know, kind of wacky spaces where um, people aren't looking and thinking and where you know by honing this unique perspective around how how to invent a company as opposed to just a technology or just you know a, a variant of an approach um, you know can actually 
uh, create something that might be disruptive. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. We really appreciate it. This video was a presentation of IEEE Boston Entrepreneurs Network, ENET. Founded in 1991, ENET offers 18 programs per year for the benefit of entrepreneurs. During a program year from September to June, ENET holds 10 monthly program meetings on the first Tuesday in Waltham, Massachusetts, and seven mid-month program meetings in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and ends each year with the July Sunset Networking Cruise of Boston Harbor. Each ENET program meeting typically features three expert speakers on a topic of interest to technology-based entrepreneurs from a wide array of high-tech, internet, mobile, and life science fields. To learn more and view our current year's schedule of meetings, go to www.boston-enet.org. You can also view archives of past meetings of ENET since 2000. And five at http colon slash slash wwwboston enetorg slash meeting slash meeting dash archives. Thank you.